Welcome everybody to the Growth Fund 4 webinar. I'm Michael Episcope. I'm here with David Shear, and we are your co-CEOs of Origin Investments. I want to thank you for attending today. If you are an existing investor, welcome back. If you're new to Origin, then welcome. Um, we have quite a bit of interest in this fund, it seems. We have more than a thousand registrants today, and that's close to record attendance. So it's really nice to see so much interest in this fund. Uh, I'm going to cover during the presentation, I'm going to go over origin, I'm going to talk about the fund overview and strategy, and then Dave is going to cover origins, investment capabilities, and then go over the fund C deal. So we have quite a bit to cover in this presentation today. And we estimate the presentation portion will probably last around 50 minutes, um, and then we're going to leave it open for at least another 20 to 30 minutes for Q&A. So all in all, it'll be about an hour and 15 minutes, and don't worry if you have to drop off. This presentation is being recorded. Everybody who registered will uh, get a copy of this in their inbox in a couple of days. Uh, we do want to thank you for the questions submitted in advance. We are going to try to answer most of them throughout the presentations, but if you do have more, uh, you can submit them through the Q&A box. I know that everybody by this time is familiar with Zoom and how to do that. One thing I, I do want to cover just early on before we even jump into the presentation is, is alignment. And really, I think this is kind of what makes Origin tick and one of the differentiators of Origin and a big part of our success. Dave and I started Origin more than 14 years ago, and it was really because we wanted to invest a significant portion of our wealth in real estate. We both came out of different backgrounds. We were high net worth, ultra high net worth investors. And in 2007, when we were transitioning from those careers, the world looked very different. There weren't nearly as many opportunities as there are today. Everyone transaction, transacted behind closed doors, I'll say. There was no transparency. And, and non-traded REITs dominated the retail landscape. And for many of you investing during that period, you remember that. You know, there weren't webinars and investment forums. So in many ways, um, we decided to build it, but we were forced to kind of build it because we wanted to invest our own capital and do it in a way in what I'll call an institutional method. We wanted to grow our capital, generate passive tax efficient income streams, just like most of you, and do it with fair fees and a great platform with good people behind us. So over the past 14 years, Dave and I have invested in all of our fund, fu <coughs> excuse me, all of our funds and deals, um, almost $65 million across everything over 14 years. And so that has really given us the unique advantage of being both investors and the fund manager. So we're sitting on both sides of the table and alignment matters. It, it impacts every decision we make. And I can tell you that we make a lot of decisions on a daily basis. It impacts our strategy, the risk we are willing to take or risk we aren't willing to take what deals get approved, what deals get declined, what's in the fine print of the PPM and the team we hire. And, and nothing has really changed from that first day. I would say that our strategy today is probably more articulated about building an institutional quality platform for the individual investor, but it all kind of stemmed from that initial seed. And so we, we hire the people who we think are the best to look after our money and yours and we build funds we want to invest in, and then we do. And Growth Fund 4, it, it's no different, right? David and I are committing a minimum of $5 million to this fund, and that's likely to go up significantly. We're super excited about this fund, but it really depends on our liquidity because today with the announcement of this fund, we have four funds out there and a lot of money in real estate. And depending on the distributions of Fund 3 and some of our other investments, that's really gonna dictate how much we are able to invest in this fund. So, you know, you'll, we'll continue to update people on that, but a minimum of $5 million. Um, and I also want to say, I mean, it's been well over a year since we started talking about Growth Fund 4, concepting it internally. I think we all have a little bit of Growth Fund 4 fatigue and we're excited to uh, start the fund. And Growth Fund 4, it incorporates much of what we've learned over the last 14 years. And a lot of what we've written about in terms of best practices around investing to maximize wealth. And so there's a lot of unique characteristics about this that I think you're really going to like today. So with that, let me, uh, let me jump into the presentation and I will start by going over origin. There we are. Slides are up. 
So an investment firm is really measured. It's measured in a lot of ways, but one metric matters the most, and that's the ability to generate consistent returns. And we're extremely proud of our results. We are ranked as a top decile manager by Preguin, and this is a third-party rating agency. We've generated a 2-1 uh, multiple and a 24% gross IRR across our realized opportunities. We've never had a loss on any deal in any of our funds, and I think that's attributable to really our risk management procedures, as, as I talked, not, not taking oversized risks. Now, candidly, that metric is in jeopardy, as we have an office deal in Fund 3 that is worth less than what we paid today, and we're working vigorously to get that value back up. But that metric, um, you know, it might be one loss in, in all of our deals there uh, in the next year or two. We have 38 team members today, and we plan on adding another seven this year to accommodate our growth. David and I have always believed in investing ahead of growth, and part of that is in personnel. Uh, we're headquartered in Chicago. We have offices in Charlotte, Nashville, Dallas, and Phoenix, and we expanded the platform. I would say it goes back six, seven years ago, really um, to talk about boots on the ground, because those are offices um, in our regions, and they serve as deal sourcing hubs so that our team can have a local presence, know the players, and just know real estate block by block. And I know David's going to get into that a little bit more in his part of the presentation. We have grown uh, exponentially. We had 30 investors in Fund 1. Many of them are still with us today. We had 65 investors in Fund 2. We had 450 investors in Fund 3. And today, we have close to 2,400 investment partners across our various funds. So thank you all for um, you know, just being here today and for your past investments as well. Our investment partners, they include everybody from individuals, high net worth, ultra high net worth, family offices, and clients from more than 40 REA groups, which is our fastest growing segment uh, at Origin. So welcome everybody. Uh, let me jump over to the next slide, and I'm going to now kind of start with the meat of the presentation, talk about the fund overview. I know many of you who are existing investors have, have heard sort of the preamble before, so now we're going to um, talk more about Growth Fund 4. What you see here is a side-by-side -side comparison of our four growth funds. And our previous three funds focused almost exclusively on value added, and they had a development sleeve as well. And they were also multi-sector funds, right? But if you go back to 2011, the opportunity wasn't in development. It was more in the value add sector because assets were trading so far below replacement costs. And the same was really true uh, during fund two, during that vintage as well, that value add was the place to be. And fund three, it started to shift quite a bit because as assets started to increase in price, they started to approach the replacement cost. And so fund three had a development sleeve and value add as well. Now, the investment strategy for growth fund four is entirely ground up multifamily development. It, there's no value add. There will be no other sectors in this fund at all. The fund, um, we are targeting a 14 to 16% net IRR over a four year period. And that equates to about a 1.7 to 1.8 net multiple. And that's 100% growth. There's not gonna be any income during that period. And the difference really between this fund and income plus fund, because we got that question a lot from people who are considering both is, is that yes, this fund, it has more risk and more return and there is no income. So if you're looking for growth and you don't need income, this is the fund for you. And if you need income, then the income plus is probably more suitable for your risk return profile. So um, so we, we got a lot of questions actually about the returns in the, the questions that were submitted. And one of them was, are they commensurate with ground up development risk? And the short answer is yes, absolutely. We see hundreds of opportunities and have a really good pulse for the market and what expected returns are in the market. And we have a consistent way that we underwrite. We follow institutional best, best practices when we underwrite, we drift cap rates. And I can tell you that from one sponsor to the next, um, two sponsors can look at the same deal, 
one might underwrite it to a 12% IRR over five years, and another one could underwrite it to a 20% IRR, right? You can make anything look a different way depending on what your practices are, how you underwrite, what variables you put into the model. And I would say that we tend and have been realistic and conservative across the board, and that has really helped us over the years. And we could easily market a 17 to 19% IRR for growth fund four, and it would be totally justified. I think the assumptions would be aggressive and who would really benefit as a result of that. Fund projections to us are really about setting expectations. And we've always been of the mindset to market what we believe is realistic and then do everything to outperform those projections. So let me take you through sort of our, our history and I'm gonna go through our past performance of each and every one of the funds. So if you look at the chart in front of you, to the left, you see fund one. And in fund one, we marketed a 16 to 18% net IRR and generated close to 28%. And that's top decile performance, meaning those returns are better than 90% of other fund managers. In fund two, we marketed a 15 to 17% net IRR. So we brought that down to reflect the new market environment. And that fund will generate north of a 20% IRR when it's all um, complete. And that's also top, top decile performance. And in fund three, we targeted a 14 to 16% net IRR. And that fund will come in close to around 13%. And in growth fund four, I strongly believe there's an upside tail here and a downside floor to what's being marketed. I think if we're wrong, we're at a 12% IRR. And if we're wrong the other way, we can easily be north of a 20% IRR in this fund. And I had one of our senior analysts, Jacob, come into my office the other day. We were just chit-chatting about this. And he, he was literally giddy about the prospects for this fund and looking at the way it's structured, our pipeline of deals, and was just you know telling me his opinion that this fund he thinks is going to be in the top two, three, four percent and just be off the charts. And he's somebody who sees it and is in it every single day. And I really appreciate that because I think I you know oftentimes look too much at the risk and I'm in it on a day to day. And, and it's nice. And we're all really excited about the prospects of this fund, but it's nice to hear from others in the firm, especially those who are in it on a day to day basis. So a couple more nuances about the fund I wanna um, kind of let you know about. This is a closed ended fund, meaning we will call your capital when we find deals. The fund is gonna be diversified across 12 to 14 assets and it'll be diversified geographically as well. Funds equity is gonna be limited to 10% in any one single asset. And the pace of capital calls is going to be fairly fast. We have, again, we've been working on this fund for over a year. Our deal team has been busy out there. And we have a need right now for more than $80 million in equity between now and kind of June and, and July. So, you know, that's, that's um, it's, a, it's a healthy pipeline. And Dave is going to go over that in his part of the presentation. Um, my guess is that we'll have the fund completely invested in 12 to 18 months. So let me jump on over to the uh, next slide. And again, answering questions, this was anticipated, but we always have to ask the question, why multifamily and why development? And there's, there's two reasons. Number one, apartment demand is incredibly strong um, right now, and it has been for many years, and certainly um, COVID has only accelerated that. And I'll, I'll quote from RealPage, and RealPage is a forecasting agency. They operate in the multifamily space, and they were quoting demand in Q3 of 2021 was in excess of 600,000 units annually. And the demand over the next two years is supposed to exceed 500,000 units. And when you compare that to new supply at less than 400,000 units, it really, it paints the picture for the supply and demand and more growth ahead. And what they, and what we, you know, are also looking at is more rental price increases in the Sunbelt markets and a lot of these growth markets. So as much as Phoenix and Tampa and these markets have expanded over the last year, year and a half, two years, there, there's more to go. Um, and RealPage itself, they're looking at five to 10% rent growth on the horizon for some of these growth marks. And that's markets. And, and that's on top of 15% um, across the nation um, overall. And some markets have obviously done better than others. So that is really, that, that supply demand imbalance is why 
We've seen rental prices and the price paid for properties jump so much in the last year. But then the fundamentals moving forward still favor multifamily as an asset class. Now, the second question is, how do you want to enter the market? And development is where we believe the highest risk adjusted returns can be generated today. And when we talk about development margin, this is often referred to as return on cost. And I'll, the easiest way to conceptualize this is if brand new properties are being purchased for $350,000 per unit, and we can build for $280,000, the, the spread that $70,000 is your margin, right? And that comes out to roughly 25 to 30%. So so that's what we talk about when we're talking about margin. We can say return on cost, but you're developing to a spread in the market, to a cap rate spread. And, and that's how we evaluate the market because it's very quantifiable, looking at what we can um, build for and then what properties are selling for. And the challenge with the value added space today is it's gotten way too competitive. That's where the bulk of capital has been raised and we see too much competition in that market. We're also just seeing an imbalance. We see 15-year-old properties trading at or above replacement costs. And if you're buying a value-add property for $280,000 a unit, and then you put $20,000 into it, and then you have to sell it in five years for $340,000 per unit to make your return, um, that's a substantial premium to replacement costs. And the asset's gonna be 20 years old at that time. Now, it can work, we just don't like the risk return of that. And if that works, then development will only be that much better. So we just don't think value add in today's market is a good bet because replacement cost will always govern the upside and quality wins out in the end. The markets are eventually going to normalize and the dust will settle. And we want to have a portfolio of newer properties at the lowest basis possible. And so that's really why, for those two reasons, why this fund is exclusively uh, multifamily and ground up development. Let me jump to the uh, next slide and I'll talk about um, deal structure a little bit. So how are deals going to be capitalized? And I'll start from the bottom on the right side and you can see like from the capital structure and, and kind of move up from there. So senior debt is gonna occupy the part of the capital structure from zero to 65%. And then we're gonna use preferred equity from 65% to 75%. So we will essentially be using 75% leverage on the property. And note, if you're an income plus fund investor, the preferred equity will most likely be provided by our income plus fund to a level of 75%. There's a lot of benefits to that. And what we plan on going over on the next income plus fund webinar is exactly this. So we'll go over this in a lot more detail. So we'd ask that you hold your questions till then. Now, 75% is a little more leverage than we've used in the past, but when you evaluate the leverage on both a loan to cost and a loan to value, right? A loan to value once the project is completed, the leverage actually comes down to less than 60%. So we look at it through both lenses and we still think that 75% is incredibly responsible. And if the development margins um, should deteriorate to 20%, um, we're still in a really, really healthy position. So moving up the capital structure itself, you can see that every deal will be capitalized with 25% equity. And what's unique about this fund is that we are gonna be investing as both a general partner and a limited partner. And I'll define what both of those mean for, um, for some of you who may not understand those concepts. The responsibility of the limited partner is bringing the majority of the equity to the table. An LP, a limited partner, typically provides up to 95% of the required equity. And for that, they control the deal and all major decision-making rights. Now, being an LP allows us to put more money into deals. It allows us to geographically diversify. Um, it, we maintain that control over major decision making. And the reality is when you find a really good deal, you want to put a meaningful amount of money into that deal. And that's what the LP positions allow us to do. A general partner investment typically provides 5 to 10% of the equity and they invest much earlier in the life of the project. The general partner position is the sponsor's position and their job is to get the project to be shovel ready, right? So to the point when we are taking it out of the ground. And oftentimes that can take 
six months to two years um, or never, right? Sometimes deals fail during that whole process. And it's expensive to get a project to shovel ready condition. There are legal fees, architectural costs, land takedown, a whole host of other costs. And so that's where we are playing also, right? We are, we are providing general partner capital to certain sponsors in the market. Oh, my camera just went out. Um, and the reason why we're doing that, there, there's two reasons. And I would say the first um, is more important is it creates a pipeline of fund opportunities. We have programmatic relationships with sponsors who have a contractual obligation to offer us the opportunity to invest as the LP because we are providing them with GP capital to get the project to shovel-ready condition. And these are projects that we also have a good feel for because we've been helping during that entire GP um, or, or the shovel-ready process to get them to the place, right? Working on the design, the drawings, doing the due diligence. And then we can make that decision at a point in time, whether or not we wanna be the LP. It's our option. It's not our obligation though, in those cases. The other benefit to providing uh, GP capital is it's higher margin capital. So typically what happens in a deal is the GP, the general partner gets a disproportionate share of the upside for putting the deal together. And we share in that when we are in these positions. Now, we got a few questions about the JV structure because of the double layer fees. So let me touch on that quickly. And there's a few points I want to make about this. Number one, as a firm, we've made the decision not to be in development. We focus exclusively on investment management. And that's important because we represent all of our collective interests during the entire investment process. And you have a lot more leverage showing up to a deal with $25 million than when you do with $500,000. And what we do is we negotiate every item with the sponsor. We understand what market rates are across the spectrum, right? When it comes to the development fees, when it comes to the asset management fees, when it comes to what fees are double dipping, when it comes to the property management fees, when it comes to land markups, et cetera. And we negotiate these very, very strong. Actually, Dave's really, really good at this. This is the part of the um, firm that he oversees. So, um, so it's great to see him in action when we're going through these negotiations. Um, and I want to be clear too, because a lot of people, they see the fees that they pay, you know, when they go direct to a sponsor and we, but we do not pay the same fees as an investor going direct to the sponsor, right? It, it's not the same. And, and the way we know that is because we've passed on a lot of deals that end up winding up getting capitalized directly, going to a site to raise capital. And we keep an eye on those deals and we look at them. And we had a deal that busted budget by a significant margin. And we were in due diligence going all the way, you know, down that path to actually do the deal. And it was by more than $5 million. We pulled out of the deal. Um, that deal ended up raising capital directly through one of these sites. And it was the fees were extremely different. And when you ran the math, they were actually much higher than all of our fees combined. So we, again, we have a pulse on the market. We know what's going on there. And so, and the other thing I wanna talk about here, right, is just our capabilities. And I don't wanna steal Dave's thunder because he's gonna talk about this in depth, but just at a very high level, we are a value add investor. This is not passive equity. This is active equity. We are an active participant during the design of the development of the project and the ongoing management when it's stabilized. And the last thing um, I'll say is that you have to quantify the cost of this, right? And the value, right? And I've talked a little bit about the value here, but the dilution of our position is sometimes negligible. It's between zero and 20 basis points, depending on the returns and structure. And from our perspective, we would gladly give up some of the profits to a high quality sponsor who we know and trust and has a track record of doing successful business so we can build a successful fund for you and us. So, and, and lastly here, you know, just with fees, you have to consider the fact that our performance fee is only 15%. And so when you put all these together, that largely offsets any fee that we're paying to the sponsor. And so between the GP um, fee, the 15% um, and the value we provide, it's, it's value that extends well beyond cost. Let me jump into the next um, slide. And then after this one, I'm gonna hand this over to, to David. And this is really with the optional hold period. And this is where 
This is a unique feature because our previous funds were buy, fix, sell. And we what we really wanted to do is make this buy, fix, hold and keeping it in context with uh, the way we believe that you build more wealth over time. So this is what we've done. Uh, you know, we've created a structure here to be able to keep people in if they want to. And it's kind of a novel concept. So the initial term of the fund is four years from the final close. And the final close will be the earlier of when we raise $250 million or March of 2023. So this is really the shortest dated fund in the market. And if you want to get out after four years, you can. You can get out of some or all of your position and the net asset value of the fund will be determined based on property appraisals. Now, David and I took a page out of another sponsor's book and we will be required at that time to exit 50% of our position and keep 50% in at that time. So really, we're both a buyer and seller at year four. And it's just to ensure a fair and objective net asset value at the end of the fund life. And to provide liquidity, we will be using both refinancing proceeds and selling assets if necessary to satisfy those redemptions. So six months out from that four-year window, what we would ask is people make that decision if they want to get out of some or all of, of their investment, and then we will plan accordingly. Uh, and I, I think for people who have been in private equity funds for a long time, they understand the benefit to this, to being able to punch out all at once. I've been in a lot of private equity. Fund tails are pain. That's usually when you have one or two deals sitting in the fund for an extended seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years and they just linger. And so this gives you an opportunity to punch out all at once. After year four, it really becomes a new fund. And it, it becomes very much like Income Plus in terms of the fees, right? The fund fees will be resized to reflect a more core plus strategy. The preferred returns will be reduced from 8% to 6%. Performance fee will be reduced to 10%. And then the asset management fees will be reduced by 25 basis points as well for each class. So the optional hold period is really to give investors the opportunity to defer taxes, generate passive income, and continue to build wealth through additional appreciation. The, uh, the 7 to 9% here, just to um, clarify that, that's referenced on this page, um, that is based on the initial investment. So you can think about it like this. You're putting in a million dollars. The million dollars grows to like $1.8 million dollars. And then you're also then able to generate seventy to $90,000 per year after year four. So you built this really big um, cushion in your investment, and then you're able to uh, take advantage of, you know, probably tax-free income. It's never, you know, 100%, but 95% of it or 100% of it will be shielded by depreciation. And then liquidity will be provided on an annual basis thereafter. And again, you know, the, the reason why we created this structure is because for, for many years, we sold assets and our investment partners, um, you know, they told us afterwards that they would have rather have just stayed in. And we saw these deals that we sold coming back as higher and higher. And, and David and I, we really felt the same way because every time we exited, it created a huge tax burden and also created um, this need to then reinvest our capital. And so, there's, there's an advantage to staying in deals long-term. And when you look back, we would have really benefited from staying in, in several of our assets just over time and, and not selling those. So we're taking a page and, and learning because here at Origin, it's continuous improvement, it's an iteration. And we think that this, this feature on this fund really solves um, those issues and, and puts the control with you. So you get to decide to exit and when you want to redeploy those uh, taxes and um, create the, I'm sorry, not re redeploy your capital and create that, um, that taxable event on your end. So um, that's it. I'm sure there's going to be more questions on this. I'm going to hand this over to David. So David, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Deep breath. That was a lot of information. That was a lot. Yeah. I have I have a lot to cover. And so I'm going to, I'm going to try to be 30 minutes. Um, so if you're pacing yourself, um, it's going to be about 30 minutes. I might have to shorten certain areas just, just to get through it all. Um, but good morning, everyone. Many of you this morning are some of Origins 2,500 existing investment partners. I'm guessing half of you are. 
And Michael and I just want to start by saying that you're value partners. Whatever fund you're in, you're valued. We work every day with our team to, to protect and grow your capital. And we invest significantly alongside you. And, and Michael covered that. Um, when I was listening to Michael earlier talk about how giddy Jacob was, that's a good word. Um, I, I'm giddy. Um, and, and, you know, I'm very much in the weeds with the acquisition teams and the investment management teams. Um, and I'll cover a lot of the reasons why I'm giddy. But, but one of the things I just want to add on, because Michael did a really nice job of covering the development margin and development right now. Um, it's really at its all time high and it's based on capital flows. There's just too much capital that's going into core and value add investment funds um, and it needs somewhere to go. And it, all this stuff is trading 10, 20, 30, 40% above replacement costs. Just to give you an example, five years ago, those same developments traded at or five to 10% to replacement costs. So it's been this really violent move um, origin because we're really agile. Um, that's one of the advantages we have. Um, we're big enough now. We have you know 38 people and sort of a national footprint and um, pretty significant infrastructure. But but we're also very small, relevant to some of our really large competitors. You know, um, our largest competitors would be 10 times bigger than us. And there's advantages to that. But probably the biggest disadvantage is you lose agility. You you, you lose the ability to move across strategies quickly. Um, and you saw that with Origin and Q our QOZ. We were really one of the first to hit market there. Um, and you're seeing this move here. Um, the last thing I'll say about development margins is it's not only outsized uh, investment, expected returns. Um, of course, nothing is certain investing, but the expected returns are outsized, but it's also a risk mitigant. And I'll just make it really simple. When we develop to a $250,000 basis, um, that's $75,000 cheaper a unit than if you bought it after it's built and stabilized. That's, a, that's the core phase. So, you know, we have a 75,000, and when you start doing the math, you know, we're doing two 300 unit buildings. You're talking about a $20 million edge that we have per deal. That's a heck of a lot of risk mitigation. And Michael and I always start every day with how do we protect capital, right? And then from there, we, we talk about upside. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in. Um, please, uh, Michael mentioned, please send all of your questions. I already see we have 10 questions and 16 chats. So I, I hope Michael, maybe you can start answering these while I go. Um, yeah, I'll do that. And I would just ask that if you're putting your questions in the chat box, please convert those. We're only going to be taking questions in the in the Q&A. It's just hard to jump back and forth. So um, move those over if you can. Thank you. So jumping right in, origin development uh, experience, and this doesn't even include our preferred equity, which is another way that we enter development. This is just our common equity. Um, it spans you know, $468 million of invested equity, 1.6 billion of asset costs, but, but more importantly, um, six funds. This is the sixth fund that Origin has had the multifamily development in. It started in fund two, um, it grew in fund three, Income Plus has a significant 20% participation there, um, as well as sidecars, of course. Um, and then we have QOZ fund one and two being the fourth and fifth. So, we have a tremendous amount of experience um, through these funds and these, these developments, but I, I'd say more importantly than the scope are the returns. Um, yes, we're a top decile manager in our funds, um, but in development, we've actually been better. Um, we, we've done better in development than any other asset that we've invested in, multifamily being you know, all we've ever developed, um, but also the consistency. Um, all of our developments have been successful um, and the IRRs have averaged well over 20%. And, and Michael talked about this earlier. Um, we don't know what the future brings, but we do know we're going to outperform our competitors. We always have, and in particular in development, and, and we believe that will only continue. So whether a competitor markets a higher or lower IRR, it, it's not really that relevant to me and Michael and our teams. Um, focus on relative performance. And, and you'll see this throughout our presentation. That's how we sort of try to break down how we look at the world. Next slide, please. So 
So in the annual deal funnel, this is really focusing on 2021. Um, the deals were, we rounded it up, but it was 1,994 deals um, reviewed. Um, and that's an awful lot of deals. We, we can't spend a month on each of those deals. So that's where we bring in our machine learning, our AI, the fact that we live in the markets. And we actually analyzed only 1,100 of those deals. And then once we get through sort of that few day desktop underwriting moves to a, a deeper underwriting, if, if it gets to that point, that's the 500. Term sheets issued means um, it has a full 20 page memo that's presented to credit committee and it's approved at credit committee. Therefore, a term sheet can be issued and then it moves into due diligence. And that's that's the period where you know we're spending you know, generally two to three months um, vetting these assumptions in the model much more uh, in detail, but also um, doing environmental, doing geotech, making sure that cost uh, analysis is accurate. And we don't formally commit to a deal until obviously it's through due diligence. And, and I'll talk about that in the pipeline a little bit later. Um, and of course, we, we closed 24 deals in, in 2021. So why this is really important to Growth 1.4 is all of our activity over the last 14 years, and in particular over the last five or six, when we were really active in development, um, it culminates with, we have an amazing deal pipeline for this fund. And that's, you know, I'll, I'll talk about some of the deals that are the seed deals of this fund, but also um, the process that, that we have, um, we're first call in all of our markets. We have relationships in all of our markets, owners of land, developers, lawyers, um, just the real estate community in general, they know exactly what origin and our teams are interested in, um, what type of multifamily, what submarkets, et cetera. Um, and that's important. And you don't get that in a week, a month, a year. It, it, it takes years of investing and having a physical presence in markets to, to have that. Next slide, please. Oh, and I should mention it, it was on that slide. The, the, the proof in the pudding is, you know, just under 50% of our deals um, historically have been sourced off market. Um, that's important. Um, when you're sourcing deals off market, you're generally getting that last five to 10% edge that, that a publicly marketed deal would probably find. Um, that's why Origin doesn't ever sell deals off market, but we, we certainly try to buy them off market. And that's the quantifiable edge of living in your markets and investing in these areas. So on this slide, it's really depicting our investable universe by states. Um, so I always describe our strategy the same way. We're, we're an investor in the Southeast, Texas and the Southwest. Um, we have done a few deals in Chicago because um, obviously we're based here, we know the city. Um, those deals have done quite well, um, but uh, we don't really like the long-term growth prospects for Chicago on a relative basis. Um, I'm not necessarily bearish on Chicago. I just think that there's better uh, relative growth in the Southeast Texas and Southwest. And so we're gonna spend our time there. Um, again, the fact that we live and have offices all over these markets. So we have an office in Charlotte. We have a presence. Um, one of our investment managers is in Atlanta. We have an office in Nashville. We have an office in Dallas. We have a presence in Austin. We have an office in Denver. It, it really, really matters. Um, not only do you get to know the cities block by block, building by building, but you can build such deep relationships when you're around the people in the ecosystem on a daily basis and you're not having to fly in. Um, I spend a lot of time flying in to work with teams and markets, but my knowledge of a particular city pales in comparison to that officer and that team that lives in that region or that city. Um, it's just not possible to know things um, in, in 12 cities as well as you know, the people that cover those specific areas. The last thing is we can, we can respond to whatever it is, the landowner, the development partner, in a day, in an hour, we can meet you at the site. And, and that's the type of agility I was talking about before. Agility doesn't just exist at a macro level where Michael and I and our senior uh, teams are deciding what our strategy is on a macro level, it also exists at the deal level. Um, a lot of deals that we get tied up, in particular the off-market ones, they come quick. And you have to have both the knowledge and the capability and, and 
you know, the ability to show up at the site and make quick decisions. And so we have a huge advantage um, based on our structure of being centrally located in Chicago, but having all of our deal investment teams um, throughout the country. Next slide, please. So Origin Multilytics um, is something we've invested in for the last two years. Um, we're extraordinarily proud of this. It, it, it really came from um, a pain point. Um, when you're building a model, um, any type of development model or even uh, a core plus or core model, the most important two factors are rent growth and the capitalization rate on exit. And rent growth itself, you know, there's really two ways that our competitors, um, sophisticated or not sophisticated, are using this. Either they use a fixed rate for all their deals, no matter what, it's two and a half, three percent in year one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, or they're relying on outsourced um, solutions. And, and those are usually provided by um, companies that license their rent growth predictive analytics to the market. And um, I won't cite the names of these companies, uh, but I will say that um, we weren't satisfied with um, their predictions and we weren't satisfied with their um, intellectual approach to even coming up with a solution. And so two years we embarked on this massive project to, to try to create our own. And along the way, um, we've now hired uh, two full-time data scientists, but candidly, they've been working here for the last two years um, as interns, um, and they are in the um, uh, undergraduate program at University of Chicago, uh, graduating this spring. And both of them um, are brilliant. Um, I would uh, not want to um, match wits with them uh, in any way at this point in my career, um, or maybe ever. Uh, but what we're doing right now, we're so far along with this, this predictive analytics that um, we're looking to patent it. Um, we believe we have something that's, um, and not patent it because we want to sell it and share it, patent it just because we want to protect it. And the reason is, I'll just touch on this very briefly. Um, the reason our model is so much more effective than what's in the market. Um, number one, we're taking in 2.6 billion pieces of data per month. Uh, and using that data, the machine learns. Um, there's a big difference between an algorithm and machine learning. And that difference is machine learning, you're not supposed to mess with. You're supposed to create a machine and feed it data and let it learn. And so if anyone's talking about machine learning and they're constantly changing it, that's an algorithm. That's not machine learning. Um, but the reason that I really believe ours is superior is we're the only model that incorporates spatial econometrics into a model. And so spatial econometrics is um, a new um, science, if you will, that's really centrally located at University of Chicago. And our data scientists are both writing their senior theses on this um, and getting it peer reviewed by all of their uh, professors who are the leaders in the world in this space. Um, spatial analysis, is, it, it, it's where um, econometrics and spatial analysis intersect. Um, it uses spatial perspective to allow submarket uh, predictions for multifamily that are superior with any model that doesn't have spatial autocorrelation. And so we'll probably do uh, a much more in detailed webinar just on this because it actually applies to all of our funds. This isn't a fund for asset. This is something we use in every single fund we have, as well as hold sell analysis on assets we own. Um, if we are looking at um, point forward rent growth in AI that's very, very low, um, and the market doesn't see it, that would be a place where we need to think about, do we want to hold the asset? Because if we're going to get paid a lot today for something that we think has eroding growth in the future, that's something that we should we should pursue. Um, so I'm going to move on, but uh, please be on the lookout for uh, a webinar just on this. And I'd like to bring on um, the lead team member on Origin, but also our data scientists um, to look into this um, in more detail. So uh, from here, let's talk about investment management, because what I just covered there is sort of the entire 
ecosystem of um, acquisitions. You know, why are we better? Well, we're better because we both live in our markets, but we have very quantitative centralized operations. Um, we're better because we're agile, because we're small enough, but we're big enough that we've been in these markets and, and people understand what we do and we get first looks. So investment management, Michael touched on this. It, it's really important. We're, we're, we're much more than a highly active um, investor or co-investor. Um, we're a co-developer in, in many of these deals. And I'll get into that at the deal level in a moment. But how do we, how do we add value? Um, one is during construction. Um, so once it moves from acquisitions, we've made an offer, they've accepted the offer. It actually, in the due diligence period, shifts to investment management. And they're going very deep into vetting every assumption so that we can review a subsequent memo that is the go, no go memo. We already have it under contract at a price, but do we really want it, right? Construction management ex expertise means this fund is benefiting from the 1.6 billion that's been invested prior. Um, you learn a lot about construction, about how to manage it, about what to look for, about what pitfalls can be, about what areas are value engineering areas. Um, and, and, you know, you also learn about what, what companies, what builders to use, what builders not to use, what type of projects a builder would do well, but wouldn't do well, um, what subcontractors a builder um, should use or not use. Um, these are all things that our investment management team um, manage and are active in the process, whether we're a co-developer or an LP, it's happening. Top and bottom line growth. Now, now the asset is built. And so in, in, the, in the growth cycle here, on a stick built deal, you're talking about 24 months of construction on, on wrap, maybe it's, it's 30, podium, 40. But once it moves to that lease up process, Origin has a playbook, literally a playbook. It's 50 pages long. There's an Origin way to do things, to do everything. And all of our partners execute that playbook. And we do it collaboratively and, and they learn that it's there for a reason. It's there because this is the optimal way to approach Elisa. This is the optimal way to approach um, retaining tenants, attracting tenants, um, having a, a positive online presence, why that matters, um, virtual leasing. It goes on and on and on. And so all of these bullets, top and bottom line growth, resident acquisition, resident satisfaction, these are all part of a playbook that we execute and it doesn't change. Um, we, we have a set way of doing things that we believe um, achieves higher operating revenue and more profits. So how do you measure that? Um, I mentioned this before, everything we do, we do on a relative basis. And the reason for that is uh, 2021 was a really good year um, for multifamily. And so I can tell you huge numbers in terms of how much our rent grew and how much NOI grew. But the reality is it was a good year. So what I really want to do is talk about how much better we did than our competitive set. Because in a market that isn't good, we can still outperform. That's value. If there was no rent growth last year, but we got 2%, that's a win. And so just, I'll just read these off, but 3.2% higher year over year revenue. That's massive. 13% controllable NOI versus a benchmark set of 6.6. .6. That's huge. 23% higher online reputation, asset scores. It's critical. You know, when you're looking for an apartment, it's one of the first things you do. You go online and you look at what the reviews are. And, and here's the interesting thing about reviews. The only way to get higher review scores is to operate a good property. You need to build a good property. It needs to be physically sound. You need to have good service. And people have to have a good experience. And that shows up in higher reviews. There's no magic bullet for good reviews other than having a high quality product and service. The last bullet is, is critical and I, and I see it and Michael sees it in so many of the questions that we had and that's risk management. And everything we do involves risk management. It starts with buying right or developing at the right basis and it moves into risk management. And I'll just give you an example that happened this morning. Um, Lots of questions today about interest rate management. You know, how are we going to manage interest rates? And, and the presumption is rates are going to go up. And 
you know, gun to my head, I, I think people are generally right. Interest rates should go up. Um, you know, how high, I don't know, but I would tend to agree with that. What we're doing is all of our construction debt, which is variable debt and has that exposure, we're swapping it and we're using swaps to swap it to fix. But what does that mean? Um, it means that you have to use lenders that have swap debts, number one. So you have to know what you're doing there. And then you have to execute the swap contract. I signed a swap today, literally this morning, and I thought about it and this webinar as I did it, it's for our uh, NOTA project um, in QOZ1. But all of these things, all the questions you have, you don't have a question that we don't think about every day. And we'll, we'll, we'll handle all this in Q&A, and I can go into more detail, but all of your questions are very good, but all of your questions are handled here, including interest rate management. It's just an example of risk management, but that's job one here is managing risk. You know what another way you manage risk? You do business with people you know. That, that's probably the ultimate risk management. And so there's just an awful lot of deals that should work, but maybe don't because you picked the wrong partner. The mitigant of that is, don't keep picking new partners. You know, we have eight to 10 partners. We've done a lot of business with them. Next slide, please. Okay, great. I have nine minutes, Michael, to make it through this. And so I'm going to be um, relatively quick here. Um, preserve at Star Ranch. Let, let, me, let me back up just for one second because this is a very important uh, macro concept. We've been working on the deals I'm gonna go over. There, there's four deals I'll go over here and then I'll mention a fifth um, for the last six to 12 months. And so everyone on this webinar, number one, you're benefiting from that labor and we're not charging you for that labor. That, that is our sort of seed gift to this fund. We didn't wanna have a fund where we, it was a committed capital fund and then we went out and looked uh, for deals once we had money. Why? Because it hurts you. Um, that's called a J curve. Right? If, if we raise a big fund and then we go out looking for deals, you're paying us to look for deals and it takes time and it, it costs you money. We're, we're not doing that. Um, we actually have been working for a year to get to the point where we are. Um, we also don't have a committed fee on the fund. So you don't pay us until we find the deal and invest in the deal. That's not different. It's better. It's better for you to not pay us until we find a deal than to pay us before. Um, and then lastly, the prices. You know, a lot of these deals we tied up in Q1, Q2, 2021. And so, you know, once we tie them up and they go into due diligence, we have them tied up at a price. The prices that we have these deals tied up for the land, they're deeply, deeply in the money, meaning the prices are much, much higher than what we paid. And so I'm super excited about all these deals, starting with the fact that they've all appreciated significantly from when we tied them up, um, when it was tied up. And we don't mark up the land. We don't say, oh, well, now, now the land's 30% higher. So you're going to, as a fund investor, pay 30% higher. We've never done it in, in any fund. We never will. That, that, that's not how we operate. Um, so you're, you're benefiting from not only all that work, but in this case, an awful lot of appreciation in, in the land cost itself. So with that, I'm going to uh, jump into Preserve Star Ranch. Um, this is actually um, our first fund four development with Geffen. Um, and you're going to hear that name a lot. And that, that relationship, um, it's one that we really value. It started with a fund three development that we did with them very successfully um, in Houston. It wound up being uh, north of a 45% IRR and a, a 2.25 multiple. So the fund three investors benefit from that, but we're building off that success. Um, and when we when we approached Geffen, we said, you know, can we just do something much broader where we co-develop with you? And what that means is we get in the deal earlier, but we get much much better economics because we're we're actively developing with them along the way, um, and we're doing a lot of the work, and, and they value that. They value our expertise um, in that process as well. So uh, Preserve at Star Ranch um, will be the first, and I'll mention a few of these deals. This is um, a build for rent in Pflugerville, Texas, which is uh, just northwest of Austin. Um, we've been incredibly active in Austin. Uh, we own 
in Fund 3, we owned an asset in Austin, and Income Plus, we own uh, in QZ, we own. So we know it very, very well. We've been there for many, many years. Um, this is 310 Class A single family um, rental units. It's purpose built uh, rental community. In terms of the drivers here, um, we're very close to Dell's uh, campus. It's two miles away, easy access to Highway 130. Um, very close to Tesla's uh, new Giga factory. Median household income, 110,000. That's very important in our machine learning and AI. If you don't have money, you can't pay high rents. Uh, so we were constantly tracking that relative to the cost and the rents we want. Um, the, the renter here is a younger renter, young couples, young families who are attracted to these um, homes that, that, that can be rented that have small yards, but yet that rental feel, you don't um, have the burden of ownership. <clears throat> and this represents, um, well, it's a it, it fourth, it's our, it's our first of five developments with Geffen under this co-development structure. Groundbreaking here is targeted for this May of 2022. And we've been working on this deal for over 10 months. Next slide, please. Haven and Apache, um, also with Geffen. So again, you're getting the, the benefit of the co-development. And what that really means is um, it's an incredibly uh, non-dilutive deal, um, meaning you're gonna get as an investor much more of the profits uh, because we're, we're doing all that development work alongside Geffen, our partner. This is a five-story, 214 wrap style development in Tempe, Arizona. Um, we've been very active in Arizona. Um, again, both in Income Plus and QOZ. This is how the deal pipeline gets so full for this particular fund. Tempe is uh, one of the fastest growing cities um, really in the country. And in terms of rent growth, it's been in the top um, one or two rent growth nationally for the last two to three years. It's projected to have over 7% rent growth next year. Um, and we, we've corroborated that. We actually um, were projecting high rent growth. I believe it's 6.5% for this asset uh, through our machine learning AI. Um, this is located right across the street from a light rail station, which is another uh, demand driver. Here, we're breaking ground in March, 2022. You're benefiting from over 12 months of work on this deal as well. So complete mitigation of the J curve here. You're investing immediately. Next slide, please. Solus at the Ranch. Uh, this is um, a deal that we're doing uh, with a development partner we, we highly value and we're, we're going to be doing uh, multiple deals with both in this fund and our QOZ fund. And that's a partner called Jackson Dearborn. Um, they specialize um, in Denver, Colorado Springs. We, for our QOZ fund, um, have already uh, broken ground on two developments in Colorado Springs. Um, with Graystar, we're breaking ground on a third uh, for QOZ Fund 2. Um, also with Graystar, also in Colorado Springs. We know the, uh, the area extraordinarily well. Um, the reason we initially came to Colorado Springs was um, three years ago, our machine learning at the time, um, and that was a, a very nascent model of it, um, had identified it was going to be one of the strongest markets. Um, we started looking at the demos. Um, luckily, we, we started um, seriously investing there. It's been one of the strongest markets in the country. Um, literally uh, did not go down one day during COVID. Uh, rents just kept going up, um, unlike almost every other market in the country. Um, generally, rents flattened or went down between March and July of 2020, and then whipsawed back. Colorado Springs never did that, just kept going. Um, and this particular development, um, three-story garden style, this is um, suburban development. Um, so it's about 10 miles northeast of downtown Colorado Springs. That's where our other three developments are, are downtown. Um, path of growth, uh, location, uh, the, the median income here is 100,000 um, and homes range between 500,000 to 1.5 million. Um, so we really like the demos um, and there's just a, an enormous need for rental housing in Colorado Springs, both urban and suburban. 
Um, Colorado Springs also has over 30 Fortune 500 companies, five military installations, and five top-rated educational institutions. And, and all these things are, are factors that go into our machine learning. Um, I would characterize those as um, livability components. The last deal I'm going to cover, uh, next slide, please. Haven and Cool Springs. Um, Haven and Cool Springs is actually the site that um, we flew to. It, it's just south of Nashville. It's in a very high-end suburb, um, just south of Nashville. Uh, I flew there, met our team leader, Kyle, who lives in Nashville, but also uh, Dave Well, Tom, Tom Briney, and Mark Turner. Um, and that's where, more than anything else, we, we inked the deal and, and signed that didn't sign, but but created uh, the relationship to really build into this co-development with Geffen. Um, we went to this site. The site's extraordinary. Um, huge barriers to entry. It, it sits um, right next to a very high-end golf course, and, and its grounds, the way it's going to be set up, um, the pool, the common area, et cetera, is going to back right up into the golf course, and it just it's an amazing feel. Um, there'll be huge demand here for this, this product because there's so, such large barriers to entry to get in. And um, 300 units, um, but I, I will, what I really want to focus on here is um, Geffen and Origin as co-developers were able to get our entitlements. Um, we actually got them last week, a month over uh, before uh, we had sort of pro forma and, and expected to get them. And that's just extraordinary. Um, if you think about the environment now, where you're disrupted by COVID, but you also have extraordinary development in Nashville, and the city is absolutely stretched and taxed, and it's a high barrier to entry community, um, we were able to work with the, both the community and the city. Um, and, and this is this is fully entitled now, um, and land closing and groundbreaking is expected actually this month. So again, back to the J curve. There's no J curve when we're investing this month. In fact, we're we're getting ahead of um, when we're actually even calling for equity at this point. Um, so super excited about this deal, um, and it's another indication of the value added by our partner Geffen, but also our investment management team who's co-developing um, in this deal and providing um, the outsized return potential because more of that profit stream comes to you, the investor, because of the work that we do. Uh, the last deal I'm going to cover is um, Lloyd Park, Grand Perry, Texas. Um, this isn't on the PowerPoint, but uh, this just went to due diligence. Uh, so I'll mention it. Um, we're working on environmental and geotech now. Um, due diligence, generally 80% of the deals that make the due diligence make it through. Um, not all do. Michael mentioned one that didn't. Um, but 80% do. This is a 186 unit uh, garden multifamily project um, in, a, in Grand Prairie, which is a suburb of Dallas. Um, and so tremendous uh, demand drivers here as well. Um, you have American Airlines headquarters, DR Horton, Lockheed Martin, GM. I could go on and on. Um, there's just an awful lot of, of growth and job growth. Um, and this, we really like the affordability ratio here, meaning uh, the income is relative to the pro forma rents we need um, are quite affordable. And those are the types of environments that set up well for future rent growth and um, candidly future profits um, for, for us and the fund. I believe, I'm, oh, I'm not done, Michael. I also have to go over fees. <laughs> Boy. Okay. So, uh, Michael, I'm going to kick it to you because I, I, I think that this is a great place for you to, to jump in. And then you can, uh, you can also, if you don't mind, uh, cover the emailed in uh, questions. Yeah, I'll do that. You're uh, you're getting a little winded, huh? I know we're uh, we're at an hour right now, but there's a lot to cover. We're actually over an hour and four minutes. So, let me uh, quickly. I, I mentioned some of this already and how the fund is going to work. So the um, the annual management fee on the fund. Uh, there's two tiers. There's one and a half percent, and then there's a one and a quarter percent for anything above $5 million. Now, what we are doing as a loyalty program for our existing investors, if you're in any other fund out there, you actually qualify for the 1.25% management fee. And that's just as a, a thank you. And that money 
that requires you to be committed to the fund um, in the first quarter. So um, prior to our first closing, which we expect on March 31st. And um, as Dave mentioned, there is no um, committed capital fee there. We actually replace that with an acquisition fee. And what that really does is it puts the burden on us to find deals and make sure. So in a fund, in any fund where you have sort of a, a committed capital and you're um, committing, you know, let's say a million dollars, well, if you have a committed fee and we only put out half the capital, you're paying on that whole thing. So this is a way back to aligning interest, right? We get paid when we find find deals. And if we don't find deals or we don't put out the money, then you know it doesn't impact you and it, it doesn't impact us on that side. So that was one of the ways that we um, designed this fund as well. The minimum investment is $50,000 in this fund. Um, it is an LLC, so you will receive K-1s. I'll talk about that in a minute, why we didn't use a REIT or REIT blocker. The preferred return on this fund is 8%. And then there is a 15% performance fee, and that is subject to a catch-up of 50-50. And we can go into the nuances of the catch-up. There's some math behind that. But the way you can look at that is if we do our job, we get 15% of the profit. So um, that's really it in, in terms of it is fully audited, very similar to our other funds, You know everything else you can expect. And those are the fun terms. So um, if we can end the presentation now and then get into the questions, Dave, I will give you um, a few of the questions. So I, I actually think we hit a lot of the questions and that's one of the reasons why this webinar went so long today, but um, here's some important ones. And these are things, you know, like David said so eloquently, these are the things we think about every day that we come in. Um, how are you mitigating supply chain delays and subsequent inflationary spikes in timber slash steel prices in your construction costs? So Dave, you wanna take that? You're on mute. Michael, I couldn't hear you very well. Could you just, just truncate the question and ask it a little? Go ahead. Yeah, so the question is about supply chain delays, right? What are we doing to mitigate supply chain delays and the inflationary impact from rising construction prices, right? Particularly lumber, steel, things that are very volatile in today's market. Yeah. Yeah, two, two, two ways we're approaching it. One, um, we're inflating our construction budgets and our pro forma. So, you know, typically we would carry a 6% contingency and now it's more like 10%. Um, it depends on the deal and, and it also depends on um, what we think of the underwriting when it gets to our desk. Um, but generally we've doubled our contingency. The other thing that we're doing um, is we're buying out um, lumber and you know gypsum and steel and these items much much earlier um, that's actually difficult because you have to then move to storage um, you don't just buy lumber then you have to actually take it and then um, figure out how to store it but we're, we're figuring that out and, and then that also is um, segueing into appliances um, appliances are also really hard to source they're not really as volatile price they're, they're just scarce um, so we're getting ahead of you know buying earlier that stuff as well um and then you know the last thing we're doing is because we have a national reach um we have the ability to interface with the subs you know there's a difference between what you read about in the papers and the actual uh buying of lumber or buying of trusses or any of these items um and there might be a 10 to 20 percent difference based on how you get to it um, and we're just really active. So we make sure that we're getting the best pricing all the time. Great, next question I'll take. Are you planning to use a REIT blocker in this fund like you did in the Income Plus Fund? Why or why not? And, and the answer to that is we are not planning on using a REIT blocker in this fund. And the first reason is that there's really no income to shield in the first four years. Um, and the second reason is because the REIT benefits that, that, that were passed during the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act earlier, uh, they actually expire at the end of 2026. So that actually coincides with when um, this fund will convert to the optional hold period. So there's really no um, true benefit to uh, putting a REIT. And we looked at it and there's added complexities to managing a REIT. And so, you know, it was something that we decided against um, because, you know, another question that came in, depreciation, especially as we move forward, if we're using accelerated depreciation, having a REIT in place 
you actually lose the benefits of accelerated depreciation because the REIT captures it and holds it. And our, um, you know, when we're doing that, we want to send back as many accounting losses to you as possible so you can use those against other gains. And there's value in doing that today. So those are, are some of the reasons why we're not using a REIT blocker. Now, that being said, this is an LLC. You're going to get K-1s. You're going to get multiple K-1s. But keep in mind that a lot of the states that we are in, Florida, Texas, Tennessee, those are zero tax states. And there are no K-1s associated with those states. So the number of K-1s is actually going to be fairly minimal. And you can expect that you will have um, your, your tax information back by, uh, by the tax deadline. So those are a lot of questions. We get a lot of questions about taxes. And I think I just answered a lot of them in one foul swoop. Uh, Dave, I'm going to ask you this question for you to answer, because um, the impact of rising interest rates on cap rates, exit multiples, and I also saw other questions come in about our underwriting standards. So maybe you can wrap those together. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so underwriting standards, uh, they really start with we don't trend rents during construction. So what, what we do is we use our own expertise, our local presence, uh, et cetera, but also our machine learning to determine um, where starting rents are today. Um, and a lot of time is put into that and part of underwriting, but then we don't trend them. And so if the construction is 24 months, then it's not trended for 24 months in the model. If it's 36 months, same thing. Um, so that's the risk mitigant. The other thing we do, um, and this is all standardized because what we're looking for are two old multiples over five to our underwriting. And the reason that's important and the reason the deal funnel I showed you earlier um, is so important. Most of the deals, 85% of the deals we look at in a given year um, and go deep on, they, they get to a 1.8, 175 type multiple. And by the way, those deals happen. It's not that we pass on them and they just die. They happen. Michael mentioned one of them before, the Nashville deal that we, we tied up. It was $5 million over. We dropped it. It happened. It showed up on one of these, uh, these sites that people do deal by deal, and, and it got done. Um, we see enough deals that we, we, and we underwrite them all the same way. Um, we don't trend, trend rents. Cap rates are drifted 2% a year. So no one on this webinar knows where cap rates are in four years, five years, nobody. But to our models, they're 10% higher. And so if they wind up being unchanged, we'll do better than how we underwrote. If they wind up going down, not up, we'll do really, really well. But that, that's, that's how we, we underwrite. In terms of interest rates, I touched on this before. Um, we share not, not so much your concern because I don't, I don't you know, Michael and I don't have an opinion on where interest rates are in five years, two years, one year. That, that isn't our job. Our job is to manage risk. And so what we do to manage risk is we say, you know what? The margins are so high right now, let's lock it in. Like that makes a lot of sense as a risk manager. And so that's why we're, we're you know, when you're under construction, that's a variable rate loan. But not if you're working with a lender that can swap, because now you can swap it for fixed debt and you've taken that off the table and, and you've fixed that debt. And so we're doing that and we will do that in this fund. And we're doing it in QOZ and we're doing it in Income Plus. And it's not because of our opinion on interest rates, it's because it's the right thing to do as a risk manager to lock in high margins. So we're gonna do it. Great, Dave, let's jump over to the Q&A now. Those, we really, we handled all the questions that were uh, mailed in at some point of this, some point of this uh, presentation. So I am gonna take a, uh, a question from Anonymous here and it says, how frequently are you going to update the NAV and when are you going to start floating the NAV? So in this fund, um, keep in mind that this is a little bit different than the Income Plus Fund. So the Income Plus Fund, the NAV in that fund is designed to let people in and out of the fund. In this fund, this is a closed ended fund. We are going to be raising it until we hit our cap or until March 2023. And after that, then we will begin to send out um, quarterly valuation updates. And we will in the interim too. So if you get in on the first close, you will also um, get quarterly net asset values and reports. But it's only then after we've defined what the capitalization table looks like, who all the owners are, 
uh, that we will start to send out quarterly reports and mark the um, fund market. But understand in the, in the first, you know, kind of one to two years of a development, there's, um, there's a lot of money going out into the development and it's, it's difficult at that point in time to quantify costs. Now, we do have a methodology to write assets up through the development phase that our uh, managing director has created based on best practices in the industry. And that's what we use uh, in our income plus fund. So I can see us using that here as well. But you know, to answer your question, the, uh, the reporting will happen on a quarterly basis and it'll really, um, the NAVs will start to be marked to market after the, uh, the final close. David, are there any uh, questions you want to cover? Do you want to transition? I mean, we have 40 in the live Q&A and we have- Yeah, yeah, let's go to the live Q&A. So I'll take yeah. the next one while you, while you look. Um, okay. So this is a, a question. What is the reason for fund three underperforming the projections? Um, apologies if this is not true and I miss, uh, misheard. So we'll answer this live. Um, it, no, you didn't miss here. Um, we did slightly underperform in our projections um, a little bit on IRR and missed on multiple. And there's one main reason. And there was a, a moment in time uh, during COVID. And it was that we decided we had just called capital to do a ground up development deal in Denver. And that deal was supposed to close on March 21st of 2020. And COVID hit and you know the, the capital got called, I think in late February, early March. And the world started sliding considerably. And David and I, you know, and the rest of the team, we all agreed, like, look, we don't know what's going on. It felt like we were going into an 08, 9, 10 recession, and we couldn't um, put money into that deal. So we pulled out, even though we had already called that capital, and we didn't do that deal. And it was one of those situations where it was the right decision with the wrong outcome. Had we funded that deal a month or two earlier, um, that deal, when we're following it through time, ended up at about a 3x return to our money. So when we look at that, you know, like, like that one decision, while it was the right one to protect capital and in that moment in time, had we done that deal, the fund would have been, you know, right at pro forma during that time. And, and the other thing, and I mentioned this early, is that we had a big exposure to office and COVID was not friendly to office. Um, a lot of it did quite well, and we punched out of almost all of it now, but we do have one asset that's dragging our overall returns down. So, um, so that's the reason why um, Fund 3 is slightly underperforming. Oh, I'm a, I have to provide that. Okay. So um, I covered supply chain, I think. Here's a very easy question. Uh, Will, will finished projects be sold to your income plus fund? No, um, you know, we're always gonna have the same answer. Uh, we, we don't do that. It's a conflict of interest, but also we publicly market, as I said before, in the broadest possible way, our deals, because you're looking to create a really competitive environment where you can get that last 5%. And, and by the way, the last 5% is much more equity, right? If we can get the last 5%, you're really getting 15% more equity if you're levered two to one. So it can be quite, quite accretive. And um, we, we make sure that we buy right and we sell right. Next question, will earlier investors have the same value as later? Put another way, what is the advantage to contributing earlier relative to opportunity costs? So when you, um, Early investors, certainly if you are an existing investor, then you get the, um, the benefit of that lower management fee if you're in by the first closing. If you're not, um, then the advantage is, is that your money is put to work and you're earning a, um, not only you're earning your preferred return. So the preferred return in this fund is 80%. And if you get in later in the fund, then you have to pay the other investors their preferred return. So you can think about it, the longer you wait, the more expensive it is to get in the fund because you are um, you have to true up investors who have already contributed fund uh, money to the fund. I have a question here. Um, thank you for your question, Gene. Um, what's your philosophy on marking up land costs when they're shovel ready? Um, I covered this earlier. We would never do that. Um, we've never marked up land in 14 years. We, that's just an added fee. It's an added fee you have to pay that we're sort of not disclosing. It's antithetical to everything we believe in. We're completely transparent. 
everything we do, we tell you. Um, Michael has answered all of the, I'm looking at 70 questions. There was one hard question. He already answered it. You know, we're completely transparent. And if we don't tell you we're charging you for it, we're not. Never happened. I'll take two quick questions from anonymous. Are the IR multiples for the pipeline gross or net? They are gross in the pipeline. And that's really the only way that you can show deals. Now I will say those are the gross returns to the fund, but all of the fees happen at the fund level. So we can't allocate fees at each and every deal and take it out of there, but that's what the fund can um, expect to, to generate. And then the fees happen at that level. And the next question, some of the potential deals seem to be located far in the periphery from the city center, almost exurban, semi-rural. Does your analysis or rent growth population support developing in these areas? And I'll say, we don't invest in exurban or rural areas. Um, what you're looking at are, are really suburban, um, suburban fringe areas, and we're not um, anti-urban. Um, it just depends on where the deal. And, you know, Dave, maybe you can touch on, because the, um, the AI really, really captures this, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how that, um, how that factors into our decision making. Yeah, we're going to do a whole webinar on this because it's it's really worthwhile. But um, it, it looks at other over two hundred variables, takes in two point six billion pieces of data a month. Um, so everyone has an opinion, but this is this is two point six billion pieces of data a month that that formulates uh, an unbiased, importantly, an unbiased opinion. Um, it, it doesn't care about where it grew up, what it thinks. Um, it's not human, right? And that's that's why we like it. We pair it with human judgment. And the thing, we think the combination of the two is pretty powerful. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on um, to a question. And I'm gonna try to answer this, but it, 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 the question is how much of your net worth is tied up at origin meeting me and Michael? That's a little personal, you know, because what I can tell you is we've invested 65 million into our funds um, over the last 14 years alongside you. Um, that doesn't include um, what we plan to invest in QZ2 or Growth Fund 4. Um, and so I'll just say for me, I, I don't know Michael's net worth. I will say for me, it's significant. Um, and what happens here with the investments um, it is very important to me personally in my own financial um, balance sheet, if you will. So um, candidly, I would work just as hard either way, um, but you have that in addition. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer. I mean, it, it's fun. My wealth manager thinks I'm, I'm way overexposed to real estate in a lot of different ways. So I, I love real estate. I, you know, it's you know definitely treated uh, me well. It's taught, treated David well. Every dollar I put into the deals has worked out well here. And I'll continue to invest in real estate. I think that's, you know, for high net worth and ultra high net worth and family offices, it's um, proven to be one of the best ways to continue to grow your wealth. And it's something I, I know and understand. And um, I, I, I'm i over allocated, that's what I can say. So um, next question here um, from Anonymous, a couple of people are asking about this. Will you accept IRA funds? We will accept IRA funds, but without a REIT blocker, um, it will be subject to UBTI, UDFI, really unrelated business tax income. Um, so it's not as efficient. Um, I did talk to our general counsel the other day. If there were enough demand um, through IRAs for this particular investment, then we could consider um, creating a REIT investment. But um, we hadn't decided on doing that just because of the complexities of managing a REIT. I'm going to cover two questions. Um, Alec, thank you for your question. His question is about, um, are we going to focus on this fund more on high-end luxury apartments or more affordable apartments? You know, ge generally we're in class A and class A minus, um, Alec, but um, what we're really looking at more than that is the affordability ratio, because you can build a higher end multifamily in an affluent area, with barriers to entry and the affordability ratio is actually quite reasonable. It might be 20 to 25%. You can build you know, very cheap rental housing in uh, an area that doesn't have a lot of incomes and maybe it's 30 to 35%. So I'm sorry to answer it depends, but it does. Um, and that's what we're really looking at. And that's also what our machine learning is looking at. But um, 
we can cover that on a deal by deal basis on the specific fund webinars. The other one I wanted to answer was um, a question about uh, Thomas. Thank you for your question. Uh, he's an investor in the Income Plus Fund. And he's asking, why would I want to invest in Growth of Four rather than just continue to invest in Income Plus? Um, Income Plus, as you know, they, Michael didn't cover this, but it's had an extraordinary year in terms of its um, dividends and appreciation. Um, Michael, hasn't it been, is it like 18 to 20% over the last 20 months? Is that right? Yeah. So, um, you know, thank you for being a partner in that fund and it's done very well. But I will say, Thomas, that the reason it's trade-off, you're not getting the dividend, right? So you're not getting that 6%, um, but you're getting a much higher expected value. And, you know, Income Plus is sort of in that 10, 11, 12%, and this is 14 to 16. So you're talking about 500 basis points higher. And, you know, and that, that's really adds up over time. Um, so it really is up to you to decide are you more comfortable in the lower risk, lower return um, investment fund, or do you want to, you know, maybe do a little bit of both? Um, that's for you to decide, but the expected value here is quite a bit higher is the short answer. So this uh, question came from John. Um, why is the income in the extra period based on the original investment versus the appreciated value when rolled into the extra hold, it, hold period? Uh, it's both, John. I mean, we, we could look at it either way, but the reality, we had to equate it to something. Um, so right now, there's not a whole lot of income to be generated from multifamily real estate. So if we equated it to the, um, to the value, um, then you can do the math. I mean, if we're talking about, you know, something appreciating by 75% and 7 to 9%, we're probably looking at kind of a 3 to 5% income stream on that appreciated value. So you just have, you know, really low cap rates in this environment. Um, and it was just easier to equate it from to the original investment, because I think that's how, how kind of people think about their investment and what that income stream is going to be in the future. Will the fund suffer the loss if a GP deal does not move forward? And the answer to that is yes. And it's also nuanced. And you have to understand that when, when we decide to fund pre-development costs, it's, it's shared with the GP. And it can be anywhere from 50-50 to, you know, whatever ratio we decide. And there's always go, no-go decisions along the way. So you might say, look, you know, to get it to shovel ready, you're going to put out $400,000 in GP money. But along that continuum, you're deciding whether or not to spend money at, at every point in time. And sometimes it can be in the very early stage of evaluating opportunity that you're putting out 50, 60, $80,000, and those are considered dead deal costs. So um, it can run more than that, it can be six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars on something like that. But the majority of uh, deals that don't make it through, they fall off in that very early sort of inning one, two, or three. I'm going to answer two questions. Uh, Melanie, thanks for your question. Uh, her question is Do we include lease renewals as a metric in our model? Yes, we do. Melanie, great question. Thank you. Um, there's just so many variables in the model. I can't go through all of them, but lease renewals are important. Um, and it's another way that we compare ourselves to our competitors. We want to have more renewals than our competitors. It's much uh, more creative to the property to get a renewal than a new lease because you don't have to turn the unit. There's no downtime. You tend to raise rents more on renewals than new rents. Not always, but generally. Um, Harry, you had a great question um, and I want to answer it. Um, Harry says uh, he just invested in QOZ2. Thank you, Harry, and welcome to Origin. Um, he's wondering what the difference is between QOZ2 and Growth Fund 4. Um, I'll tell you what's not different. Um, we underwrite the same way. So QOZ Fund 2 deals have the same required return on capital, two or multiple over five with all of our standardized um, way that we underwrite that I talked about before. So there's no difference in, in that. The big difference is the type of capital. So it's on your end, right? So QZ2 needed a capital gain from you to qualify as income that could be put into a QZ that would get all the tax benefits. Growth Fund 4, any income uh, can come in. And so this is, this is for our investors and our partners who don't have capital gains or not, not enough capital gains but they still want to participate in development as an investment. Um, so thanks for your question. 
This question is from Matthew. How does a co-GP aspect of some of the investments affect my liability as a passive investor? Um, it doesn't. Um, we don't guarantee debt even in that position. So it doesn't impact the fund or you as an investor. So I, I know we have so many more questions, Michael, but we're really a half hour <laughs> over. We're 15 minutes over what the new standard was. So there's a lot of questions we didn't answer. I'm more committed to, to answering and being transparent. So um, if you want them answered, please email me or Michael or our team. Um, my phone number is also on the website. Um, so feel free to set up a call with my assistant um, as well. Um, and so Michael signed us in, I'll sign us off. Um, again, we value you as investment partners and many, many people on this webinar are partners. And so thank you for that. Um, and then for, for new investors or people who are interested, we want you to know as much as you possibly can before making an important decision. And so that's why Michael and I do this. That's why we write about it. We have an education section on our website. Um, that talks extensively about how to vet a manager. And that's what we are. And what the benefit is of a, of a fund versus individual deal investment. And you, you could spend an awful long time there. Um, and we want you to, uh, because we think an educated investor will make a better decision. Um, hope, hopefully an investor would, when educated, think that we're the best, best choice. But whether you do or don't, um, Please educate yourself on, on all of this. It's really important. You work hard to make your money. Make sure that you're investing it in the, in the best educated you know, process possible. Um, so thank you for your time. And Michael, if you have anything to add, um, I've enjoyed uh, talking to all of you. Uh, the only thing I want to add is um, we got a couple questions and this is uh, just sort of blocking and tackling. The PPM is going to be done in the next um, week. So if you have an interest in the sun, please reach out to somebody in the investor relations department. If you don't have a direct contact, you can go to our website and connect with somebody there and they will send you um, the deck, the PPM and any other information um, that you request on this. So thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it.